Well, good morning, and welcome to worship on this, the 11th Sunday after the Pentecost. It is a good time and a good place for us to be the gathered people of God. Welcome to those who are joining us online. A um, few announcements as we begin our time together. Uh, first, blessed are those who die in the Lord. Uh, most likely you all have heard, but Donna Siegfried died this past week and entered the church triumphant, and so uh, we will gather Tuesday morning at 11 for her funeral here. Her visitation is also here the night before from 5 to 7 p.m. And so um, invite your prayers uh, for Donna's family and dear friends um, as we prepare for, for these days. Um, also, uh, we have pie still. Um, and remember what I said last week. If, if we don't eat the pie, if you don't eat the pie, like, we will eat the pie um, after everything. <laughs> um, so um, there's, I believe we have whole pies still available, and there's sliced pies still available. Whole pie. Okay. So not much sliced left, but one of every um, whole pie available, too. So we can hook you up with pie, Okay. Um, so uh, please, uh, you know, think about that. But like I said, if, if you don't eat it at home, we will eat it here after everything. <laughs> um, maybe that's not a bad thing. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Wednesday evening we will gather for worship. And then also um, in the coming week we are preparing for a wedding here. Um, Jesse Olchenbruns is getting married, and so we will celebrate um, Jesse and Brooks Union on Saturday, and so again, something more to pray for, to add to your prayers this week um, for their families and for that gathering, um, for their marriage, and for the safety of their, um, their celebration. All right? Um, there are other announcements in your bulletin, so please take note of them. Uh, September is, is coming fast, and so... Um, and um, so we will be kind of gearing up um, for Sunday school and, and all of that sort of stuff that's taking place. Um, any other announcements that need to be made? Hearing none, then I invite you to stand as you are able and let us continue with the brief order for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear and receive the good news. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. As the forgiven people of God, we join in singing our gathering hymn.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. let us pray. God of all creation, you reach out to call people of all nations to your kingdom. As you gather disciples from near and far, count us also among those who boldly confess your Son, Jesus Christ, as Lord. Amen. Please be seated. first lesson today is from the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Here is the reading. If for you who remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests, or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. 
I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestors of Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Here ends the reading. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 103. We'll hear the response. I'll sing it. Please join me the third time. The second lesson this morning is from the 12th chapter of Hebrews. Here is the reading. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things so that we cannot be shaken, may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. Here ends the reading. this day according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. 
When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, and children, will you come up and join me? I know Mara and Caleb are here. How are you? Good. So, I have a question. Do you know what the word Sabbath means? What do you think it means? Take a guess. Wild guess. No ideas? No. What about you all? What, is the, what does the word Sabbath mean? Hmm? Sunday. Sunday. Okay. Well, kind of. Sabbath means to stop, actually. Um, and it it is easy, right? Yeah, stop. Well, I mean, stopping is a little, I mean, it's easy, but it's hard, right? Sabbath means to stop, to rest, full stop, okay? And um, in, if we were to go back to the very beginning of scripture, in the creation story, God rests on the Sabbath day, right? Or on the seventh day, right? Yeah, he rests. He takes a Sabbath. Yeah, he rests from his work. And so he creates a day of rest for all of creation. That's what Sabbath means, is to stop working, to stop um, uh, hustling, to stop and to just be, right? To stop and to rest. So what do you do to rest? You sleep, you take a nap. Oh, I love naps. What else do we do to rest? Do you, have you ever maybe gone, maybe go, going for a walk is restful, right? I mean, you are doing something, but it can be restful, can't it? Giving your eyes a little Giving your eyes a little rest. Resting your eyes. Oh, yes. My dad used to say that all the time, and he was really sleeping. Um, but, yes, resting one's eyes, right? Giving them a break, right? And in, uh, elsewhere in the Bible, it talks about how we're supposed to give the land a break, too. Um, and and it, so it can rest from its work. But yeah, that's what Sabbath means, is to rest. And Luther, in his small catechism, um, reminds us of that in, the small, in, in his explanation of the third commandment, to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And one of the things we do on that day is to, to come to church and to hear God's word, right? What if we all laid down and took a rest? Yes. <laughs> well, we could, right? The pews are padded, aren't they? So we could rest, right? Yeah. We could do that, couldn't we? But yeah, we are commanded by God to rest and to stop um, every so often, aren't we? Yeah. Will you pray with me? Okay. Repeat after me, please. Dear God, help us to find rest in this busy life. Help us to do things that renew our mind, our body, and our soul. Amen. All right, thank you.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to all of you this day from God the Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. The Sabbath probably isn't what we tend to think it is. It's a very churchy word, isn't it? Sabbath. You don't hear it very often outside of Sunday morning. It's become a religious term divorced from daily life. But what's it for, really? What does it mean? For much of Christian, and indeed American history, keeping Sabbath meant coming to church. Show up, confess, receive absolution, hear the scriptures, share the peace, commune, all that good stuff. Then go out and bear Christ to the world. Yet the scriptures speak of Sabbath long before we had a church. It's not a, on a Sunday, is it? The biblical sab Sabbath is Saturday. It actually starts Friday night. But why is it such a big deal? What does it, why does it merit one of the Ten Commandments, right? Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The Sabbath is arguably the defining characteristic of the Hebrew and Israelite people, even more so than circumcision, more so than the Torah. What set the people of God apart was that they kept the Sabbath. So highly it is held that it's codified in the first chapter of Genesis. On the seventh day, God rests, whatever that means. The Sabbath is the capstone of creation. Some have called it the world's first labor law. In ancient times, only the wealthy could afford to have true leisure. Only those with enough slaves, enough servants, enough serfs to have the labor done for them to accrue both time and wealth. And this freed the elite to contemplate the higher things of mind and spirit, of philosophy, literature, art, philosophy, theology, the very things that make us most human. The Sabbath democratizes all of that. Before we had a weekend, before we had a 40-hour work week, before we had the Sabbath, one day on which to rest. And it wasn't to be wasted on the lazy. The meaning of the Sabbath was not merely self-indulgence. The Sabbath was a sanctuary Time, the purposeful cultivation of spiritual leisure. Indeed, a space for holy boredom. And it's into this openness which creativity and imagination and contemplation flow. Truly divine gifts for the rich and poor alike. These days, mindfulness is all the rage. Take the time to meditate. Take 15 minutes to focus on your breathing. Now, for me, 15 minutes is a long time. Maybe five minutes to focus on my breathing. That sort of thing. And, if we, and we need an app to do it, right? There's so many. We need some sort of digital aid directing us because it's alien to our culture. We've been raised by consumerism. We can't avoid it. It's in the air we breathe, the screens we watch, the food we eat. We are all trained to think of ourselves as consumers so that we divide our day into either productivity or consumption. In other words, we're either entertaining ourselves, which includes shopping and eating, or we're earning money with which to entertain ourselves to buy things. We produce to consume and consume to produce. But it wasn't always so. We used to have the tradition, the spiritual practice of holy silence, holy boredom, time set apart to just be and not do. We don't know what to do with that now. We're petrified of silence. We're ashamed of inefficiency, of not being productive. That's why I think the church confuses a lot of postmodern people. What's it for? Is it productive or consumptive? Does it make us money or does it entertain us? Now, I'll be the first to admit that there are some churches that exist for making money, and some that are all in on wild entertainment. But that's not Christian. It's just American. The same holds true for civil society as a whole, for book groups and bowling leagues and Boy Scouts and anything that requires in-person, voluntary commitment. If it doesn't make us money or produce what we consume, we are simply baffled by it. So, yeah, I don't think that fa falling church attendance is
is a religious only problem per se because it reaches far beyond the bounds of organized religion. But it is a spiritual problem. And it is a spiritual problem because we don't have Sabbath rest. We don't know what to we don't know what to do to just sit around and be human, to be bored and at peace and that in a truly healthy way. Every faith has a contemplative tradition. Every faith knows that God is found in silence. So much of Zen practice is just learning to sit still. If we can't find silence, then we can't hear God. And if we can't be at rest, we are robbed of being human. We're all just beasts of burden, now with anxiety. Of course, in the scriptures, beasts of burden are to have a Sabbath too. Even the land gets one year out of every seven years to rest because creation is good in and of itself. It, doesn't, it needn't always be productive. It needn't always be at work. Nature is intended to just be. Would that we had learned this long ago. The Sabbath is holistic. It's ecological. Rest is a part of creation. Indeed, the part that makes us whole. In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus falls afoul of certain religiously minded people when he dares to heal a woman on the Sabbath. Ah, 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 saith the scribe, that looks like work to me. And thou art not to work on the Sabbath. They are um, fastidious in keeping the law and keeping the Sabbath, but they seem to have forgotten what it's for. The Sabbath is not some arbitrary rule intended to set people apart, to make them holier than thou. The purpose of the Sabbath is humanity. It is for healing, for liberation, for the establishment of human dignity. Jesus cures a woman who had suffered 18 years. He restores her to health and to wholeness and to even to her community. It's all pure grace. Sabbath was made for man, Jesus teaches, and not man for the Sabbath. It isn't just about keeping the letter of the law, but remembering the purpose of the law, the reason we should keep it in the first place. The law is not intended to place burdens on our backs, but rather to break our bonds, to set us free, free from dehumanization, from commodification, from the exhaustion of spiritual sterility. The Sabbath makes us human. The Sabbath sets us free. Now it is true that we as Christians are not bound to keep the Sabbath as our forebears did of old. There is no one Sabbath day for us, right? Be it Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. But we are enjoined to take the time to listen to God's word. And this means more than simply reading the Bible. Though, of course, we should be doing that, too. We must make for ourselves sanctuaries in time, little Sabbaths when we are not earning, when we are not spending, when we are not doing, when we are simply are, when we listen, we breathe, we love one another, we welcome leisure without laziness. And this opens us to higher things, to art, to music, to ideas, to experience. It engages the mind. Yes, but it also transcends the mind into the realms of the spirit. This is where dreams are made. This is where we sub-create with God. Now maybe this could mean just turning off our phones from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Imagine that. A little technology fast can make for a Sabbath of the soul. I recently read somewhere that 25 years ago, people fled to the internet in order to escape from the real world. And now we flee to the real world in order to escape the internet. Now, I'm not entirely a Luddite. Connectivity can be good, but it can also be a lot of noise. And for as easy as virtual community is, it will never take place of real life. Now, I'm not real crazy about reality most days, but it is the only place to get a decent meal. I'm not saying that there's a one-size-fits-all Sabbath. You alone may know what brings your spirit inner peace. It might look a whole lot different for an introvert than it does for an extrovert. 
But keeping Sabbath should be liberation. It should be both release and relief. It is the reminder for us all that we are so much more than merely our careers and our consumption. We are the kings and queens of creation, made so by the cross and crown of Christ. The Sabbath is necessarily spiritual simply because people are spiritual. The world is spiritual. To forget that is to forget ourselves, as we so often do. It's either Sabbath or slavery, beloved. It really comes down to that. And if the Exodus has taught us anything, it's that God would not have us be slaves. So let us make room in our lives for Sabbath to be quiet and holy and free. In Jesus' name. you are able and let us together confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He 
descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. You crown your church with steadfast love and mercy. Guide us continually in our baptismal covenant to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Use our diverse gifts in service to the whole people of God. Merciful God, you satisfy the needs of all creatures. Protect the habitats of fish and birds. Repair ecosystems damaged by misuse, neglect, or natural disaster that all creation may thrive. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You make your ways known to all people. Inspire the rulers and the leaders of nations with your compassion and mercy. Raise up activists and community organizers to restore places affected by violence, poverty, and inequality. Merciful God, you provide justice for all who are oppressed and relief to all who are afflicted. Heal those who are bent over by addiction, depression, and anxiety. Set free all who cry out under the weight of mental, emotional, and physical distress. We pray especially this day for Ken, Irma Jean, Kim, Cole, Amanda, Tim, Jennifer, Ruth, Carla, Sophia, Luann, Patty, and Marge. Guard both day and night those who serve in our military both at home and abroad for Matthew, Jordan, Lucas, Mitchell, and Patrick and for those we name before you now in the quiet of our hearts. Merciful God, you call us to delight in the Sabbath. Renew our bodies, our minds, and our spirits in this worshiping assembly. Give rest to all who lead our congregation in worship, study, and service. Merciful God, Generations, bless your holy name. We give you thanks for the communion of saints who have gathered in prayer and praise in this place. Support us in your love until we rest forever in you. Merciful God, receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And now let us share that peace with one another. God's peace. And now as we are seated, our ushers will wait upon us gathering our offering, our tithes, our gifts to God.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he gave it to them all, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Together we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Come, the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Please be seated, and we will commune this morning um, using the center aisle.
I've got cable, so. you are able. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Go in peace from this place and make peace wherever you go. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we go on our way today, we do so singing. And there is coffee fellowship in the, um, down in the narthex, in the gathering space. So please uh, enjoy one another's company today. <laughs> Now, beloved, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.